Hello, Raider Nation. Welcome to the Believe in Raiders podcast on the Believe Podcast Network. I'm Dennis Ackerman, pleased to be joined by former Raider great Stanford rep. Stan, uh, earlier this week, Raiders head coach Josh McDaniels announced a change at quarterback. He's benching Derek Carr for the final two games. Jared Stidham now will take over as starter, while Chase Garbers will be the number two quarterback. You know, big things were expected from the Raiders offense, uh, but for the most part, it's never really materialized this year. Carr's been the Raiders starter for the last nine seasons, which has produced just two playoff appearances. So, Stan, uh, is it safe to say the Carr era is over with the Raiders? Oh, yeah, it's starting to look like that just because when you really think about everything, this guy's been started for nine years ever since he first got to the Oakland, now Las Vegas Raiders. Well, how do you go back to him after you bench him? For Jared Stidham for these final two games, what are you going to do? Come back in March or April and say, hey, man, you know, uh, sorry about the last two games, but uh, hey, let's go get him this year. So I think that uh, just when you look at that or even when you look at how John Gruden didn't exactly have the most glowing remarks to say about Derek Carr. So it seemed like if he, even if John Gruden would have been retained, he may have been looking for a different type of quarterback or should I say a different quarterback. So for Josh McDaniels inheriting uh, Derek Carr, not actually hand choosing him as he became the head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders, it's not far fetched to believe that this right here is a signal for what's to come in the offseason. And then when you look at how Derek Carr has played this year and how Derek Carr leads the league in interceptions right now, currently, after the performance that we saw on Saturday night, Christmas Eve against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and correct me if I'm wrong, D.A., uh, would you call the Pittsburgh Steelers defense the steel curtain? Oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> no, you would not. And he threw three INTs against those Pittsburgh Steelers en route to a loss, which pretty much signifies the Las Vegas Raiders having no chance of making the playoffs, even though mathematically they still have, what, 2% chance, 5% chance if they beat the 49ers and the Chiefs and get some help and things like that. Uh, so you can see why everything is transpiring the way that it is, uh, even though you get a lot of players that you're hearing that didn't necessarily agree with this benching, but you can you can definitely see why the decision was made to bench Derek Carr for Jared Stidham. Well, here's head coach Josh McDaniels on the move to bench Carr. I'm going to throw in some sound there, and I'm going to come out and read the promo, and then we'll get more back into breaking down what's going on with Derek Carr in three, two, and one. All right, before we get to more on Derek Carr's benching, let's get our promo read in here. Dan, the Raiders, uh, they're only 10-point underdogs on Sunday against the San Francisco 49ers, I'm sure that Look number might. But listen, what you they're only 10 right. point under. Yeah. Like only. Right. <laughs> as, if, <laughs> as if like that's like an accomplishment of some sort. But anyways, keep going. <laughs> well, basketball is back and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. And as your continued source for all sports wagering information, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's the NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, even golf. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use the promo code BELIEVE to receive your rewards. Bet Online for the game starts all right stan you mentioned uh Derek carr the uh not only career high but leads the nfl with 14 interceptions this year his passer rating just above 86 which is his lowest since his rookie season he's completing just over 60 percent of his passes uh compared to where he's normally in the upper 60s but the flip side you know he also owns the raiders all-time leader in, in touchdown passes the first quarterback in raiders history to throw for more than uh 30 000 yards stan this is only going to be the fourth and fifth games Carr has missed in his career, entire career, and the other three were all injury-related. But, Stan, you know, here's the main reason why they're sitting him now. His 2023 salary of $33 million and yeah. his 2024 salary of $7.5 million would be fully guaranteed if he got hurt. Now, the Raiders can cut Carr three days after the Super Bowl and take a measly $5.5 million cap hit. He does have a no-trade clause. So, Stan, which is the likely scenario that you see moving forward? The Raiders releasing Carr or looking for a trade partner and perhaps – doing him right and sending him to a team where he really wants to go to finish out his career. 
Well, I think they're going to find him a trade. I think they're going to attempt to find a trade partner. And to be honest with you, I think that they're going to be able to find one relatively easy just because when you look at Derek Carr, Derek Carr is by no means a scrub. No. But Derek Carr by no means is is out there playing like, like Zach Wilson out there for the New York Jets. So, you know, when you look at it from that standpoint, it just seems like it's time to move on because maybe for him, always having the turnover of a different offensive coordinator, a different head coach. Maybe he needs more continuity. For Josh McDaniels, maybe that's just simply not the type of quarterback that he really would want to work with going forward. So it's a, I think it could be a positive for both parties. But to your original question, I do believe that they're going to try to find a trade partner. That way they don't have to eat that five and a half million in, uh, in, in dead cap money. So that right there in itself, from a financial standpoint, that would behoove them to find a trade partner. And then also, I don't think that there's any bad blood. I don't think that both parties hate each other. I don't think that. So I think that uh, they're going to try to find a trade partner, somebody that he can go to, somebody that he can mesh well with the offense coordinator, the head coach, something that's more so handpicked because he has the no trade uh, clause in his contract. He's going to have to approve the trade, no doubt. So I think that they're going to try to do right by him, send him to a place where he wants to go or a place, a place that is at least appealing to him. And then if they're not able to come to an agreement on that and then said team isn't able to come to an agreement with the Raiders on the compensation, then you'll see the Raiders probably go ahead and just simply outright release him. Well, he has talked about Stan. I think he said it last year sometime in 2021 that he wants to retire a Raider. And you yeah. know, he wants to be a preacher uh, at some point. He wants to play golf. He wants to hang out with his boys. Um, I, I don't think, though, this is just my personal opinion, that Derek would want his career to end this way. And no, go, of course and not. And go out that way. You, you know what I'm saying? So, Stan, let me ask you this. You said the bad blood. And I do believe that Derek is the ultimate team player. He will do whatever he can to help this Raider franchise win. That even means you know going home for the final two games. How much do you think owner Mark Davis played into this decision to sit Derek the final two games? Oh, man, I, like, I really, really don't know that answer. I'm, I'm not even going to sit up here and try to speculate. I'm not going to try to cast any aspersions, anything like that. I honestly do not know how much he played into this decision. I simply think that when you really look at it, if, even if you are a Derek Carr supporter, even if you are a Derek Carr fan, it's hard to argue against the decision after the way this season has transpired. The guy leads the league in interception. Let's go ahead and just look at the simple stats. Like you already said, barely over 60% completion percentage throughout the year. On Saturday night against the Pittsburgh Steelers, 16 of 30. That's just over 50%. 5.8 yards uh, an average, one touchdown. Three interceptions, three sacks. Now, we're not going to put that all on him. That's sure. the offensive line. That's the D-line getting after the quarterback, putting pressure on him. But the 20.2 QBR. And then when you look at the actual passer rating of 42.2, that right there, got to put that on him. And I just asked you that question. Would you say right now the Pittsburgh Steelers defense is anything comparable to the steel curtain that we saw back in the 70s? No, and I just to elaborate on that a little bit, I think the glaring thing to me is two out what two out of the last three weeks, Danny's been outplayed by Baker Mayfield, who just showed up for the Rams, and then a yes. rookie quarterback, Kenny Pickett from the Steelers. He out he, he literally he did. He got outplayed by both those two in two out of the last three games. So I understand completely what you're saying uh, about the Steelers defense one hundred percent. No, it is not reminiscent of those great seventies uh steel curtain defenses, not at all. And yeah, so you know, just in and to the original question, that's why even if you're a fan, which I'm pretty sure Mark Davis is, it's hard for me to it's hard for me to go against what the GM or the head coach or the offensive coordinator. It's hard for me to go against what they're what what, what they're suggesting to me in our weekly meeting that they should do because. How can I sit up here? And, oh, no, let's go ahead and, you know, continue down the path that we've been on. Well, the path that we've been on, look where it's gotten us. And so. I also put this on Josh McDaniels as well as Derek Carr. Look at how many blown leads you've seen out of the Las Vegas Raiders this year. Now, obviously, the defense, they've been out there stinking it up, blowing those leads. But as a quarterback, as an offensive coordinator, as a play caller, that's where you're like, okay, we got a 17-point lead. 
Now we need to go and try to find ways to elongate our drives. We got to find ways to slow the game down. So we got to find different ways to do that. And that right there, I put that on Derek Carr and a Josh McDaniels. But once again, uh, I, I'm not sure how much of uh, how much of this played into. I'm sorry. I'm not sure how much Mark Davis played into this decision. I'd be willing to bet based on what I've seen, based on the tea leaves that I've been hearing, and even going back to my days with the Oakland Raiders. Mark Davis doesn't really like to get too involved with the football operations. Obviously, he's the owner. There's no doubt about that. Al Davis was somebody who was more hands-on with the day-to-day operations, the depth chart, the starting lineups, things like that. Mark Davis doesn't appear to be as hands-on as Al Davis was. God rest his soul. So that's why, to your point, to your question, I would probably say Mark Davis probably did not factor into this very much. Now, I'm pretty sure that the, the suggestion was ran by him. I'm pretty sure on that. But as far as it being his idea, this being something that he went, called down to Josh McDaniels and everybody else to go ahead and say, hey, you know what? Let's try out the young guy. I don't think that Mark Davis did that, no. All right, Stan, let me ask you that. It's being reported that Carr and the Raiders agreed Derek should stay away from the team yeah. uh, so he won't be a distraction. And you and I talked about distraction in the offseason when I when you said let the – uh, let Derek Carr's final year play out. And I said, well, Stan, that could be a distraction to the team, something that's hanging over them uh, all year long. And you're like, no, DA, that's no, 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 no. It might be something temporary. So here's where I feel like the Raiders could actually use Derek Carr so Jarrett Stidham can lean on him. Because you know Derek Carr is going to kill him not to be there for these final two games. But at the oh, same no time, doubt about it. Derek Carr is the ultimate teammate. He is the ultimate team player. And I feel like he would do everything that he could possibly do to help Stidham succeed. So what are your thoughts on the way that's kind of been handled where the two sides reportedly agreed Derek should stay away? I yeah, think. even though we know both sides didn't damn near agree to that. Exactly. Um, that's see, what sits that's, wrong with me. That's what sits wrong with me. And see, that's where it gets tricky. And I say that because we all know Derek Carr's a team player. We all know that. So then your question would be, you can understand why he's going to be a healthy scratch these final two weeks because the potential of him getting possibly hurt. Let's say Jared Stidham gets injured. He has to go in for Jared Stidham. He gets hurt. Now they're on the hook for 23, 24 fully guaranteed salary. So you understand him being a healthy scratch, but him not even being at the facility, that's where it gets very interesting because that has nothing to do with, well, we want to make sure he doesn't get injured. Right. Because, the healthy scratch, you're still at work every day. So him not being at the facility, now that makes me wonder, okay, did him and Josh McDaniels get into it? Did they have some sort of a disagreement where it's like, you know what, like stay away. We don't want you here. So I, I really don't know how that played out. If I'm just looking at it objectively, I have to wonder, did Derek Carr give them any sort of a signal? Did he give them any sort of an indication that, I already don't like this move and I'm going to be visibly upset, visibly unhappy for these final two weeks, having to stand holding the clipboard and being in street clothes, or I'm sorry, just, you know, being in sweats as a healthy scratch. So it makes me wonder, was it a situation where, okay, we know you're going to be unhappy. We don't want your, we don't want your unhappiness affecting the rest of the team or simply because everybody in the locker room still wanted Derek Carr to be the quarterback. And just simply him being there, not on the field, not with the helmet on, not in the huddle, maybe that's going to draw the ire of a lot of the teammates as far as them being mad that he's not in the game, but still being there, which means they're not going to be positive. They're not going to be helpful. They're not going to be supportive for Jared Stidham, who's now going to be at the helm for the final two weeks. So I don't really know all what happened, but for – him to not be there the final two weeks and for it to originally come out as Derek Carr has been benched for Jared Stidham. Then it's he's going to be benched the final two games. Then it's going to be he's a healthy scratch. Then it's <laughs> he's not even going to be with at the facility. That to me shows, OK, somewhere along the line, there was an argument that was had or a strong disagreement where now. This is what we're deciding that, you know what, it's probably best that you're not at the facility uh, for the final two weeks. So with Derek Carr being the teammate, the team player that he always is, we all know that about him. It just it makes you wonder what happened because something happened. 
Something happened. I guarantee it wasn't a, a uh, yeah, we're going to bench you for Jared Stidham. And, oh, by the way, uh, just don't show up for the next two weeks. I guarantee you it did not happen that simple. There was some sort of a disagreement, heated discussion, you know, something like that, that probably led to that final development within the story. Well, Stan, if we look ahead to 2023, now it's going to be on the Raiders' brass that they're going to decide, yep, we are going to move on from Derek Carr. What do we do at the quarterback position right now? I think the Raiders are slated to pick ninth in the upcoming uh, April draft. Um, I don't know if they're going to – we talked about a trade, but Stan, you know there is one name we're going to hear over and over and over again in the offseason, and that is Tom Brady. Obviously, he has connections to Josh McDaniels. Uh, They were together in New England for many years. Brady is going to be a free agent. He's had a so-so year. The Bucs uh, are likely going to win that NFC South, but it is not a strong division. Brady has not had a great season. So, uh, Stan, I, I don't know if he is in the Raiders' plans, but at 46 years old, um, I don't think it's – it wouldn't be my first, second, or third choice. He would not be. Oh, I think that uh, right now, when you look at who's available, who's right. going to be available in 2023, he definitely will be at least one of my top three. Now, obviously, like I said, you got Pat Mahomes, you got uh, Joe Burrow, you got Justin Herbert, you got Josh Allen, you got, you know, so many quarterbacks out here that are doing their thing. But are they, are they going to be available in 2023? No. Exactly. So that's why Tom Brady would still be one of my tops. Now, I don't want Tom Brady to be a Las Vegas Raider, not because I don't think he'd be good, but because I don't want him to have to suffer through that nonsense. And I'm going to explain this. Tom Brady needs to go back to New England. And I say that because New England, aside from the final play uh, against the Raiders a couple weeks ago, New England is led by Bill Belichick. They're buttoned up. And I think part of the reason why Tom Brady even retired for the six weeks he did earlier this year is because you saw so much of the undisciplined part of the Bucks starting to really start to rear its ugly head. Tom Brady ain't used to undisciplined. Tom Brady's used to discipline. He's used to practice being at a certain time. He's used to structure. And guess what? There's only one team in the league that has that type of structure. It's Bill Belichick. You really, really think that you're going to have structure out there in the desert? Sin City? No. That's led by Josh McDaniels. They let the New England Patriots use the facility in the preseason. So that's why if, for Tom Brady, I think he should go back to New England just because that's where he was at his comfort zone. That's where he simply was able to have the structure because Tom Brady is still a good quarterback. There's no doubt about that. He's been playing not so well over the last couple of weeks, but I think a lot of that has to do with the lack of discipline. So, I personally don't want to see him in a black and silver uniform for his sake. Not because I don't think he'd be uh, productive, but for his sake, no, I wouldn't want to see him there. Just I, I think that uh, I think he deserves better. All right. Well, let's talk about the Raiders starting quarterback on Sunday. And that's Jared Stidham. Uh, the Raiders acquired him in the offseason from the New England Patriots. He's yeah. thrown 61 passes in his career, including 13 for the Raiders this year. Stan, he has never made an NFL start. He's going up against one of if one of the best, if not yes. the best defense is in the NFL facing the 49ers, you got Nick Bosa, Fred Warner, a nasty, nasty 49ers defense. I mean, nothing like getting thrown to the wolves in your first NFL start, man. No doubt about it. And that's why, like you said, I mean, Derek Carr is better than Jared said. At least right now he is. Yes, he is. How do we think Derek Carr would play on Sunday against the San Francisco 49ers? So that's why, you know, just to your point, like Jared Stidham, let's say, let's see what the young guy has. Let's see. Maybe he can go in there. He can play like Brock Purdy did against uh, Tom Brady in his first career start. Who knows? But I think that uh, you got to go and just throw him in there. We can see right now the Raiders got to beat the 49ers and the Chiefs just to have an opportunity to get a chance to qualify for the playoffs, which we both, you and I, don't see that happening. No. So that's why, hey, throw the kid in there. And let's see what he has. Maybe he might be a deer caught in headlights. Maybe he might actually go ahead and he might triumphantly <laughs> go and overcome everything that's uh being that the deck that's being stacked against him. So right now, it is what it is. Uh, obviously, we don't really know much about him, but we know that he's come from New England. So just at the very, very least bit, he's been he's been groomed by Bill Belichick, somebody who we all know that usually has you prepared for almost any situation. He ain't Tom Brady. He ain't Jimmy Garoppolo. But we can go ahead and say that at least we know that he's been groomed 
by the best to ever do it as far as head coaching and just being under Josh McDaniels even last year uh, with the New England Patriots. Stan, let me ask you this. Someone who played eight years in the NFL, all on the defensive <clears throat> side of the football, beg your pardon, excuse me. How impressed are you by the 49ers rookie quarterback, Brock Purdy? What he's doing, Mr. Irrelevant, the final pick uh, in the 2022 NFL draft. You know, I tell you this, uh, maybe it's me going to University of Houston. Maybe it's me not being highly touted coming out of high school and things like that. I I, I love the underdog. Like, I love, the, I love that. And so I love the underdog outpacing, you know, the, the front runner, the guy who was the five-star coming out of high school, you know, the first round draft pick, the guy that, you know, won all the awards, the, you know, one that got all the cool girlfriends and this and the other guy. I love that. So for Brock Purdy, I love this for him, Mr. Irrelevant to now being relevant as fuck. So to me right there, I love that. Now, as far as me being completely flabbergasted by this, because Kyle Shanahan, to me, Kyle Shanahan is to quarterbacks what running backs were to Mike Shanahan back in the 90s. Ah. So you saw Terrell Davis, Hall yeah. of Famer. Man, dude was a freaking baller. We all know that. Terrell Davis leaves. Then what do you see? Orlandis Gary. You see Mike Anderson. Yep. You see uh, you see uh, uh, Tatum Bell uh, for that brief time he was with the Broncos. You see Clint Portis, his rookie year. So Mike Shanahan, with that stretch run game, he knows what the hell he's doing with running back. And with Kyle Shanahan going all the way to his days in Houston, Texas with Matt Schaub, to his days with the then Washington Redskins, and then obviously with the 49ers and how he's able. I mean, you remember Nick Mullins? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the way that he's able to take these quarterbacks who you've never even heard of and they get in his system and they're actually playing pretty doggone well, you're like, okay, wait a minute. So I believe for me, Quarterbacks of the Kyle Shanahan, what running backs were to Mike Shanahan as far as him knowing how to get the best out of them, how to get the most out of them, how to go and try to hide their weaknesses and accentuate their strengths. So that's why for Brock Purdy, I love that because he's now center stage. And I really want to see this guy make a deep playoff run. I really, really do. Just because there's going to be so many, there's so many quarterbacks that were drafted ahead of Brock Purdy. Mm -hmm. And look what he's going to be doing to them while they're sitting at home watching him so i love that for him as far as me being completely surprised flabbergasted befuddled not necessarily because it's kyle shanahan who's that brain trust over there and the plays that he calls dan i want to get back to the raiders and now then their loss to pittsburgh on christmas eve running back josh jacobs he vented his frustration as the losses clearly are wearing on him then here's what he had to say in I quote, I'm tired of dealing with this. Every day I come in here and I bust my ass and I see guys busting their ass and the results are not there. For me, the last four years, the result has not been there. And quite frankly, I don't know what else to do. He then went on to add, it's bullshit and it's on us. Everybody wants to talk about the defense, but they made their stops when they're supposed to. We have to help them out. And I'm tired of saying that. It's frustrating. So let me ask you this, Stan. Does this sound like a guy who wants to be back in silver and black next year? Uh, no, it doesn't. But if they present him a contract that is m something he can't refuse, he would definitely will be back in the, in the black and silver. And I would not in any way frown upon him if he did that. Get your money, young buck. Like, no matter what, get your money. Uh, that's number one. But number two, uh, everything that he just said, correct me if I'm wrong, the final score with the Steelers and the Raiders on Saturday night was 13 to 10, right? It was indeed. So the Raiders gave up 13 points on defense. You're doing your job on the defense side of the ball if you're giving up 13 points. If you're scoring 10, you're not doing your job. So that's why for Josh Jacobs, I love how he said, that's on us. And for that being on us, who's a part of us? Derek Carr, three interceptions. Now, obviously, Josh Jacobs had only about 44 or 45 rushing yards in the game. So clearly, he could have done better. They could have blocked better for him. So that, to me, right there in itself shows that while everybody loves Derek Carr, while everybody's a fan of his, they want to see him succeed, this, any other, there's guys on that team that are like, you know what? Our quarterback play could be better. <laughs> you know, I don't want to say it out loud, but like, it could be better. That's what I took away from that. But yes, I do believe that Josh Jacobs, coming from Alabama mm -hmm. in college, mm -hmm. coming from that program to this dysfunctional program, he definitely... Uh, would uh, like to see a different scenery, a different organization. And so 
Uh, it's going to be interesting to see exactly how all that plays out. But I do believe that if the Raiders come to him with an offer that he cannot refuse, he will be back, back, uh, back in, the, in the black and silver. All right. We'll stay on the Raiders. Also lost a couple other players uh, on this time on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, Chandler Jones is done for the year, yeah. suffered an injury against the Steelers. Starting linebacker Denzel Perriman is also done for the season after suffering a dislocated shoulder against the Steelers. He leads the Raiders in tackles for the second straight year. Dan, yeah. this is amazing. He's the first Raider linebacker to have multiple interceptions in a season since Thomas Howard and Kirk Morrison in 2007. The law wow. firm, I was just about to say, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I still remember that vividly. So, Stan, let me ask you, he's 30 years old. Perriman's an unrestricted free agent. Would you consider bringing him back? And if you would, what kind of deal? Um, uh, I would definitely look into bringing him back. Uh, I don't know if I would go and just completely break the bank on him, but I would definitely want to bring him back because he's showing stability. Obviously, he's making plays, made to the Pro Bowl last year. So I think that, uh, I, I think that he's definitely worth bringing back. There's no doubt about it. Uh, maybe for a two-year deal, Stan, because you know he is on the other side of thirty. He's yeah, you know he's got the injury right, but I think he's a steadying influence on that defense from yes. all accounts. It sounds like he's a good locker, uh, good presence inside that Raiders locker room as well. Well, Stan, you know the Raiders weren't the only team making uh, news uh, in the AFC West. Uh, the Broncos uh, fired their head coach Nathaniel Hackett. He didn't even make it through the year. No. Um, you know they've been a huge disappointment as well, especially on the offensive side of the football. I think they're last in points scored this year and. Russell Wilson just hasn't really seemed like a good fit there in Denver, has he? No, he hasn't. And I think that that goes all the way back to Seattle, that there was something that those guys out there in Seattle knew. And then you look at how Geno Smith going to the Pro Bowl this year as his replacement. And I think that so much of Seattle, when you really watch them on offense, a lot of it was backyard football. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was just Russ being Russ and just making stuff happen. They didn't really have timing patterns. They didn't have pass plays that were, you know, on a certain spot, things like that. It seemed like it was a lot more backyard style football. And for Nathaniel Hackett, probably wanting things to be more on time, on schedule. Maybe Russell Wilson didn't gel with that. But also, like I said before, everybody is so surprised and so shocked to see this precipitous uh, decline for Russell Wilson, is, as am I. But a lot of people had Russell Wilson as such on a high pantheon because of the two Super Bowl appearances, the one Super Bowl victory, which we all know a lot of that was led by the Legion of Boom. So I once again come back to this. If we take away Russell Wilson's two Super Bowl appearances, if we take away that championship, do we view him in as high of a regard as we do right now? I don't think we do. So then that right there means we're not as surprised to see this decline because we're not viewing him as high. Now, he clearly has declined this year. Oh. Man's a, what, a nine-time uh, Pro Bowl, so he's going to the Hall of Fame. There's no doubt about that. But in my personal opinion, much like we saw with Shannon Sharp saying just a couple of days ago, in my personal opinion, from everything that you hear, everything that you start to see, when Russell Wilson got married, I believe it was over there in, in Europe, it wasn't really that many Seahawks players that were there. That to me was always a little bit of a red flag. These, this is who you get dressed with every day. This is who you, this is who you go to war with every day. Why are there not more guys that A, you invited, or B, wanted to attend? And when you look at how online, and I, and, and I know that I'll probably get a lot of pushback on this, but a lot of people are not going to, a lot of people are going to intentionally misinterpret what I'm about to say. When you see on Instagram, social media, how Russell Wilson is the consummate husband, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, like he's just like the the perfect example of a husband. There's no doubt about that. He's loving. He's mature. He, he listens. He's intuitive. He's all of that. So, like, I mean, kudos to him. Great father. Great husband. All of that. So but the thing is, is that you started to also see how because it seemed like they were rubbing in people's faces, it probably started to cause a little dissension within certain guys. And their significant others in that locker room where now your girlfriend is, why can't you be more like Russell Wilson? Look what he did for Sierra and this and the other. I think that started to cause some of the guys not to like Russ as much on top of how they felt like he started to get too much credit for their Super Bowl victories, too much credit for them being the 12th man up there in the Pacific Northwest and all of that. As you heard guys like Richard Sherman, 
Bobby Wagner, certain guys that you would see that make certain little comments about him. So I think when you look at all of that in totality, and then now he comes over to Denver, how you hear that he has his own office, you know, the own the parking spots. How I remember hearing somebody said that how if you want to call Russell Wilson, you got to like schedule it, you know, like you got to schedule a time to call him, you know, and things like that. So that right there probably didn't bode well. And just when you factor that in with probably him not getting, him not meshing with Nathaniel Hackett's offensive system, you know, it's not completely out of the realm of being able to imagine this uh, this uh, precipitous decline just because, you know, he already was in a new conference, new city, you know, new team, new play caller, new offense coordinator, all of that. But when you don't gel with your teammates, and we all know this, you can have all the players in the world, but if that chemistry is not right, it's not going to matter. It's not indeed. All right, I want to talk about another quarterback, and you wanted to bring this up and talk about this. Mac Jones, his slide last <laughs> week. <laughs> you know. The Cincinnati no, no, no. Bengals. Go ahead, Stan. Take yeah, it. you know, and and the thing is, I, I I was actually just watching Mark Sanchez on the herd uh, not too long ago, and I, he was talking about how there was a play back in 2009 where he threw an interception to Darren Sharper. Darren Sharper's running it back to score a touchdown, and how he has a convoy of blockers, one of them Jonathan Vilma, and he dives down, try to take out Jonathan Vilma's knees, and then I started to think about, you know what? Me as a corner. If it is a toss sweep to my side of the field and I got a pulling guard who's the lead blocker for the running back coming towards me, what am I going to do? I'm going to take out his knees. I'm not going to take on that big guy, you know, head on. I'm going to take out his knees. That way I can go ahead now at the very least cause a pile up, eliminate the lead blocker, and then maybe one of my linebackers or safeties can come and make the tackle. Now, for Mac Jones, what made it dirty, what made it horrible was that him doing that, it was behind the play. Okay. Like the guy, the, the, the guy running for the touchdown, the, the guy who intercepted the ball, he's already in front of you. So you now dive into Eli Apple's knees. That's what makes it dirty because the play is already ahead of you. So now if it's a situation like Mark Sanchez, you're diving in front of the lead blocker. That way you're taking out the lead blocker. So now somebody could possibly come and make the tackle. But Mac, you're behind the play. So you're eliminating the what? The, the trailing blocker? So that right there is what makes that play dirty or, should, or makes it just makes it unnecessary rather than just the simple fact or just the simple act of him simply uh, diving at a defender's knees. Like, I mean, that, that's what anybody's going to do when because as a quarterback, you throw the interception, you're now on defense because the defense now has the ball. You're now on defense. And what do you do on defense? Me as a defender, I'm going to take out that lead blocker's legs. That way, hopefully one of my buddies can now come make the tackle. But being behind the ball carrier, that's what makes it unnecessary. All right, Stan, I'm going to give you the final word. Let's talk about Sunday's game. Uh, Raiders, San Francisco 49ers, New Year's Day. Give me a prediction. Oh, man, you know, right now, San Francisco, they're, they're eyeing those playoffs. Yeah. And right now, they are eyeing everything in January. And right now, the black and silver is in their way. D'Amico Ryan's doing a great job, a fantastic job of how he's been uh, coordinating this defense all year long. Nick Bosa probably going to win Defensive Player of the Year. You got those guys in the back end, another pro bowler. I always struggle to pronounce his name, but he's a starting safety for the 49ers. Yes. You know who I'm talking about I out do. of USC. Yes. So I want to give much respect to him. Uh, and then Fred Warner, probably hands down the best or second best, maybe behind Shaq Leonard for the Indianapolis Colts, is the best Mike linebacker in all of football right now. So I don't see the Raiders being able to move the ball much. Even if they had Derek Carr, I wouldn't see them being able to have much offensive success. So I think that uh, the Raiders defense is going to have to come up really, really big, which is hard against Kyle Shanahan and Brock Purdy and <laughs> George Kittle and Christian McCaffrey and everybody else. So uh, I don't see the Raiders uh, being victorious in this game. Hopefully they can go ahead and keep it close. Uh, I would probably say my final prediction, I would say 27. I'd say 27-17. Okay. I, you're a little bit more optimistic than I can. I just think it's very difficult for Jared Stidham getting thrown into this one. That's the, like I said, the 49ers, uh, you, like you mentioned, they are the number two seed right now. Uh, I think they're going to steamroll the Raiders. I, I, I have a bad feeling this is going to be like a reminiscent of the New Orleans Saints game. I think the Raiders are going to lose. I think they're going to lose big, maybe 24-7, to 27-7. Uh, let's just hope that 
let's just hope the moment's not too big for Jared Stidham. I think that's the thing we got to look at is the moment not too big from him. And whatever the result is, we'll take it from there and see how the Raiders finish up these last two games, partner. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, like I said right now, Jared Stidham, this is a this is a great dress rehearsal. This is a great job interview for him to go ahead and try to put his best foot forward for these final two games because this is exactly how that sort of thing happens. You see, several years ago, Pat Mahomes was on the bench the entire his entire rookie season. He starts the final game yeah. of the regular season, does pretty well, and then before you know it, bam, now we see in Pat Mahomes, best quarterback in the league. Big contract, got all the endorsements, Super Bowl champion, all this and the other. So uh, everybody out there, we all know life is all about opportunities. And you got to make the most of them because they may not come around a second time. Absolutely. Amen, Stan. All right, Raider Nation, that's going to do it for another edition of the Believe in Raiders podcast presented by BetOnline.ag. I want to wish all of you a very safe and happy new year. For my partner, Stanford Route, I'm Dennis Ackerman. Thanks so much for listening. And may all your punts find the coffin corner.